Oh my goodness, yeah, you're, you're one of the GL working group. My God, give them two copies. Okay, we're going to get started and we start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, it's just to give you an update to what's trans transpiring uh, right now out there. Uh, as you know, several years back, we were given authority by the, the past uh, DEP head of remediation about um, filling in and making larger wells out of a couple of bedrock wells that we had out there. We contacted him again, uh, the new representative, to to ensure that we're all set to do it. Uh, at this juncture, they were second guessing whether or not it was going to be reimbursable. So we're, we're carrying on a discussion and dialogue with them at this point to ensure that those items, once they're remediated, uh, are reimbursable at 90% as they've given us assurances in the past that they were. I provided you some documentation of correspondence that we've had with them in the past to ensure that we just haven't heard back yet so I'll keep you posted and let you know um, hopefully a favorable response for us. And we have two houses down there that we that we monitor their wells. Right, we, right now we're monitoring their 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 wells. It, it's not a, um, a forever agreement. Uh, at some point in the future it will, it will sunset for us but right now we, we're obligated to monitor them and to make sure that they're working properly. Old business discussion. The town and Route One property with the Butter Jim Plumunde. Yes, um, uh, we'd asked uh, you. You folks had asked me to invite Jim to one of your business meetings to discuss. Jim had spoken to me before about uh, possible some options out there, so he's here tonight to discuss directly with you his thoughts and whatever you know correspondence or discussion you would like to have with him on this. Jim, what do you have in mind? Well, I, I approached the town manager um, knowing that this, the town was actually looking to develop that property or a potential site for development of the property for the, for the town hall um, in that I have actually another 200 by 200 lot adjacent to my existing property that, quite frankly, I'm, I'm becoming of the age that I, I don't believe it has any use. I don't <laughs> feel like I'm going to develop that in the, in the future, so I, I've kind of put it up to offer a portion of that lot if necessary for the town hall, um, one of the higher ground areas in, in that parcel. So you've walked the site, of, um, up, I'm on the right-hand side of the right-of-way. Uh, in also looking down the road that if this town would actually develop that street, um, I actually have 50 feet of frontage that Dr. Trenelage in front of me has uh, expressed an interest to basically improve his parcel, uh, talk to the town manager about 
potentially having common driveways um, in the back there so we can actually only have one entrance exit on from, from the street. My frontage would be on the new proposed street uh, rather than on Route 1 and then I would relinquish land in the front to Dr. Trenelage for his parcel to get larger and more accommodating, more conforming. So I, I just want to put it out there and I don't know what you're comparing for for sites but I, I think uh, I think professionally and looking at, at that land there, looking at what I see in Arundel, it, it seems like the Route 1 corridor has had some successes recently uh, with, the, with Vinegar Hill and you know, the other end of the Route 1 with the Arundel machine and so on. So Route 1 seems to be the development. You know, the the, the uh, development seems to be happening in that corridor right now. I just wanted to offer up my land uh, if, if it was um, you know, part of it worked in, into your plans as far as or, in, or needed for development of the town hall in the back there. Now, are you thinking that I know where your entrance is? Your entrance is actually beside our uh, right away. Right, right are now, thinking, my entrance is half on the right away and half on my property. Are you thinking that would stay no. the right away that would go in there, or we'd have to move it over? It would be basically the new street would be developed, and I would my frontage would be on the new street. Yeah, but we would have to redevelop that whole right away, or just part of it to yeah. get in there. Because would, I know that when you look in there. It goes in and you have your parking area where your people park. Yeah, on the right hand side there. But like I said, my driveway actually goes in and I'm, I'm half on the right of way and half on my property at this point. Um, just because we had better lines of sight when we did it. Uh, but like I said, I, I, I would think that that would be abandoned and the street would be on the legal 50 foot right of way that actually would be needed to, to the town or is needed to the town. So let me, I can't exactly remember it. If, your street could we could that that road be used to go straight into the our property? No, is there the, the, the town's the property, to, pro, town street is to the left of my driveway. I understand that, but your your current driveway, mm -hmm. there isn't a building in the way if we if you, to use that to go straight out back. No, it would have to uh, straddle both my property and the right of way. Uh, you know, I, I think Phil can add something as far as, if, are you concerned about the, the low area on the left-hand side? Well, my concern with that problem <coughs> is the cost of putting a road to get back there. Mm -hmm. You know, you get that pretty sizable ditch, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it's pretty costly to get back mm -hmm. there. I'm looking to see whether we can share a driveway with an existing driveway that's there to minimize the cost. But in in order, in a, little, a little bit of that, my thought was, if you ended up with another hundred feet of property, another lot that was hundred by two hundred, you would actually be have to short. You'd be able to shorten that road by a hundred feet. So uh, two hundred dollars a foot for a street. Four hundred. So, so there's forty thousand. There's forty thousand dollars in development costs if you could shorten that driveway, that road by by hundred feet. Where's that lot, Jim? Behind your building? Right behind. Actually, I sit perpendicular to the one. It's actually. I own two 200 by 200 lots. Mine sits on the first one. There's another 200 by 200. So if we took a road in and you teed off it, would that, I don't know what the setback is there, would that leave you enough setback to your building? Right. I'm off that yeah, road? I'm actually, my setback is determined on that right of way, which was 70 feet at the time. I think they've reduced it now. You know, the backyard was 75 foot setback, and the front yard was 70 feet setback. Oh. But they've reduced that since they. I'm not, a, I'm not up on the zoning yeah, map, but yeah, I think yeah. they reduced it drastically to like 25 feet. So are you saying that you would deed that lot to the town if we develop the entrance? Yep, yep. basically that's why, I, as I say, I don't have any need for it. It's a little bit self-serving for me in that if you develop that road, I end up with my frontage on that road. Um, I, I do have thoughts of building another building kind of on my expanded property, which would be 300 by 200, just for more storage of my equipment and things like that. Now, speaking out loud, yeah. and this might be a question for Phil, uh, let's say we kept the road where we projected it to be anyway, and that 100 by 200, could that be used for the septic system that was designed to go under the parking lot, which was such a huge cost? Could that leach system go on that 100 by 200? Okay. Depends if it's ledge again. Yeah. If it's ledge, probably not. Right. 
Yeah, Mike, the, the existing building okay. sets sets on a uh, you know on on ledge at this point, but not in the back section. I don't know what it is. It it drops off on the back. Uh, there's a piece of wetland <clears throat> which would be pretty much remain on my parcel, the extra hundred feet that I would keep. Yeah. If we had Sebago look at that option at all, no. no. No, this was this was brought up after Sevego had done their initial uh, review on our behalf. So, if you, I'm, I'm sure if you want them to look at it, we can we can ask them to do that, and they'd be more than happy to do it. I actually have a topo on that whole lot, so I could leave with you. Okay, great, thanks, too. Because that might change the numbers and change your location. Certainly, yeah. My initial thought was to use the existing driveway to minimize the cost, but you know, to Tim's point, if the building was moved over a little bit closer, maybe that offsets. Well, at least it's part of that way. driveway is the right of way anyway, so yeah. it wouldn't be putting in a whole new right of way. It would just be putting in the park that we own. Which would be like a 25 by whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. You'd probably end up tearing up a lot of what's existing oh, I'm pretty to, sure. to bring your two utilities yeah. in. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure, but it would still be, you know, less than having a fill that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get around. What size the power on there, Jim? You know? uh, what do you mean on that? Uh, like the telephone poles is on? They're on, the, on this side of it. So there's no power poles on my side. I actually come off uh, Bobby Taylor's backyard off of my power. There's a line extension that runs down Bobby Taylor's, between Bobby Taylor and That's what my power comes up. But it, you know, I think knowing power, it's just a matter of putting a point pole on the, the easterly side and, and then going underground from there. Yeah. yeah. So, Are you Central Maine? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. I don't know if power must stop, but... Out of the fish market. Yeah. Uh, I like the fish market. So basically, I just want to put it out there. I've talked to the team, and uh, if, if it's something that wants to be or you know, <laughs> looking to do a development there, I think that would be a part of it. Um, so I'll have, have Keith talk to Sebago and have Sebago go in there and take a look at that and give us a figure on that. Yeah, I just, we just want to be want to be clear, you know what what we need to do. You know, what we are, our road is going to be versus, you know. I want to make sure of that and obviously we want to minimize. Now, uh, Jim, our, our tax map shows it as one complete lot, but you have uh, you have. I actually bought it as two separate lots, so they came together when they were under the okay. same name. All right. So you have a plan that shows them both as yep. separate. Oh, great. Uh, I may I may reach out to you and yep, see if I, I can get them. I can leave that with you. Okay, great. Okay. Anything else for Jim? Put that information and have Sebago take a look at it. Typically what I'd be doing is riding my bike on the Eastern Trail. I usually pick it up and go to Drake and go to Kennebunk, and I've been doing it really fast since those bear sightings. Yeah. So I really kind of appreciate the, uh, the time. But uh, I kind of wanted to start you know, just with a, a little overview of the Sheriff's um, Department uh, operations, and then, and, and then we're going to go down to uh, the Chief will take over when he speaks specifically about um, Arundel. As you most, most of you know, York County has 29 counties. And 15 of them have their own police departments. So the sheriff's office doesn't cover those towns, even though we have jurisdiction in those towns. Uh, so we cover 14 towns. But because of our um, lack of staffing, we entered into a call share agreement with the state police. And the state police cover five of those towns. We, we cover them at night and we, we call share with them. But, but they typically cover Alfred, Lebanon, Paulus, Lyman, and Dayton. Now, we have contracts. We have uh, 14 deputies that are in our general rotation. And, th and those deputies, they're assigned different places. And contract towns, like Arundel, really help us out. 
it, it, it gives us one point of contract, and it truly is a good community policing program, because each one of you know if something happens, who are you going to call? You're going to call grade 7, or who, you know, in the uh, in past contract. It gives you one point of contact, and that's your ambassador at the, at the police department for them to say, hey, listen, we need to follow up on this crime or what have you. And it has proven to be a successful model. Uh, accompanying Arundel is Waterboro. They just voted for their second contract deputy. Acton Shapley share a contract deputy. Parsons Field and Lemington. So, and of course we have a school resource officer. So this really supplements our patrol. So, and let me just be very upfront. I appreciate that. I know this is an expensive endeavor, and I appreciate that you're taking the time to chat with us about that. And we believe that a second contract deputy is warranted here in Arundel, and we think that that a second contract deputy will clearly will increase that quality of life that you have. We do see that there are some things as Arundel is growing with Cape Arundel and some of the other developments right there on Campground Road with the, uh, uh, there seems to be a lot of construction going on there. You know, we think that it's only going to increase. And I, I think it, it I, would, um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the, uh, there's a lot of heroin in places like Benefit, and that will eventually spill over. And I think we've already kind of experienced that. But that said, I think that the chief developed a PowerPoint program to really give you all a good snapshot of where we are in a bundle and some of the things that we're experiencing and what we're seeing. Thank you, Sheriff. Each one of you has a packet, but uh, for the general audience also, I think this is very informative. What we thought we'd do is give you a, a snippet of what it's been like in the last five years uh, with regards to what's happening here uh, in Arundel. Calls for service. Uh, I went back to 2011. You can see the totals. Um, and uh, I've got a misprint here. I think I've got to check on this number here. But um, you can see your total numbers right here of total calls for service for the last um, five years. Self-initiated activity. And let me find that number for you right now just so that... Uh, well, we typically always make one intentional mistake to see who's going to take that. <laughs> we didn't give you folks a chance. I, I, I think it was what, what it would probably be is... is the um, duct 1769 from 3195, and, and, and that's going to be your discount. It's going to be, yeah, it's 1574, 1574 on that number. So what we've seen is, is over the last few years, um, we've had a transition with um, uh, Deputy Troy Chenard leaving. Uh, he was here for a few years, and we had another uh, temporary uh, contract deputy um, fill in. So we had a transition period in amongst this. But given, uh, given where we are, um, I think you can see where the totals, we had a big year of calls for service in 2014 but, uh, and 2013, but clearly the level of calls, as I'm going to show you, are going to come into play here. So maybe the numbers may have decreased quality and the type of calls also have changed. If we can just follow what one second on that, this is exactly what happens to contract towns. When we first come in, a lot of towns will say, well, we don't need a contract. Like Cornish is talking like that, well, we really don't need a contract. And I'm telling the Cornish folks, listen, when you get a contract, you're going to be surprised at the activity because you've got somebody spending 40 hours in your town. So oftentimes when people first get a contract, calls for service go up. They said, my gosh, there's more crime now that you folks are here. It's not that there's more crime, it's that we're just uncovering it, and that, that there's more follow-up to a lot of these things. Because everybody knows, if you solve one burglary, you don't solve one burglary, you're going to solve ten of those burglaries, because that person has, has been doing that. So this is exactly where we, need to be, where we need to be, is that we started out with a lot of calls for service, and a lot of self-initiated things, and most of traffic stops, and eventually what's happening is, is we're evening that out. And I think we've hit probably where Arundel is, right around 1,500 calls. But that's, that's good because the people know where to call, and it's also a lot of the self-initiated stuff is stopping, is it, we're addressing things, those nuisance calls, those quality of, uh, of life calls, before it gets to the point where somebody has to call the police, like an ATD complaint, you know, people screeching their tires, that type of thing. Thank you, Chief. Yep. 
So you can see, let's take burglary for example, uh, the decrease in the number of burglary calls has gone down to nine last year. Uh, that's very significant. That happens with police presence. A police cruiser being in town, the visibility, uh, the contacts, and uh, people following up and saying, hey, you know, I saw this suspicious vehicle, um, and getting that in information to the, uh, uh, to the deputy. Domestic violence, I'm sorry to say, is, is that the trend is pretty much level across the board, and that's what we're seeing countywide and statewide. Um, number of drug-related uh, incidences, these are substantial drug-related uh, instances. So, as you can see and may expect, we're seeing more of those type of things. We're seeing uh, more drug activity, uh, more drug investigations, and that type of thing. Um, so, this does not even include uh, the deaths that we have seen from overdoses. That's just drug uh, investigations that we have conducted. Emotionally disturbed uh, persons, um, these calls are quite con time consuming. Uh, and also, as you can see, um, there's, a, there's a, a, you know, a regular stream of these type of calls. They are very time consuming because with an emotionally disturbed person, you know, we look to try to, first of all, safety for everybody. The family may be in jeopardy, the deputy may be in jeopardy, and then we want to get them to some safe place. The time consumption on that kind of a call is very significant. Follow-up investigations, this is where, you know, the, the value in the program is um, in having the follow-ups because that's where you find out more information, your investigations get proven, you can solve cases and that type of thing. Motor vehicle crashes. Um, the red numbers are personal injury numbers. As you can see, we started out in 2011 with 122 personal injury crashes. That number has slowly been decreasing, thank goodness. Um, and accidents in total have been decreasing. And I came before you about a couple of months ago. Um, I had done a lot of research and, and, uh, and gotten this data here from the Department of Transportation so that I could write a grant, which was for almost $20,000 for speed enforcement. Because I'm going to show you another, and I think it's in your pamphlet, where Rundle uh, is with, with crashes. It's, it's kind of significant. And then motor vehicle stops. Um, clearly motor vehicle stops is those blue lights flashing, the police officer, the, the deputy out there stopping vehicles, warning summonses, has a great impact. People see the lights and they get to get the expectation that there's somebody here or they're driving down the road. Oh, I remember there was a deputy that stopped somebody there last week or the other day. We're hoping that people will conform to the rules of the road, and our enforcement actions hopefully is stepping this up. So these are also um, great numbers as far as uh, the, you know what's going on out there. For and a lot of this is all self-initiated activity. That's what the, the deputies are doing here in the rumble. previous. So when we take a look at the average time on scene, I did a, a data sheet uh, on this for Arundel and looked at the calls that we handled in 2015. And as you can see, assaults, they take over an hour for us to investigate, potentially get witness statements, arrest the person, maybe take them to jail. So we're tying up, you know, or the deputy basically is doing their job, but it's for, um, you know, over an hour time period. Burglaries, a half an hour time period. Domestic violence, uh, again, just over a half an hour. Thefts, uh, missing persons is also a very time consuming, um, and we've had a couple of those here in Arundel. Uh, motor vehicle crashes with uh, personal injury, close to an hour. Time the deputy gets there, investigates, uh, and follows up, he's got an hour's time period. Sudden deaths, uh, well over an hour, and then unattended deaths um, is also uh, well over an hour. I looked at our response times, an average response time is 16 minutes and 51 seconds, because that's the average. We can be there earlier. Sometimes I've found where the deputy found something and calls it in immediately. Um, so the time period fluctuates 
That's the average, and it can be longer, depending upon where the deputy is. If there's no contract deputy on, where is the zone deputy? Uh, the travel time could be a little bit, uh, a little bit more. And I told you also about fatalities. Um, your county has uh, the distinction of being the worst county with 21 fatalities last year. Nine of those fatalities were in the area that either the state police or the sheriff's office covers. So that's again why I saw a need and the sheriff's office saw a need to do something about this because we want to save lives and uh, we, we definitely have some issues. Here again, this is speed-related crashes. What I showed you here is, these are the towns that we cover. And I looked at the percentage of times that we cover crashes. What is the percentage? 36% of the time, when I looked at all, well, 30% of the crashes are happening in Arundel. The next busiest town for us is Waterboro with 21%. So, you know, a lot of it, Route 111 uh, is some of that issue, Route 1, uh, the camp campground roads, some of the intersecting roads. We definitely have some, uh, you know, crashes, speed related, and, uh, you know, we had some in the news not too long ago here in Arundel. You've got the layout for what the cost is for, uh, you know, a deputy. I think maybe um, some of this you may have seen already, I'm not sure. Um, but that's a cost layout, and we can talk about that uh, in a little bit. One of them that I just, uh, I see on your sheets there that I skipped by, and I didn't have it on here as the PowerPoint. But I also looked at the time of day. Crashes are happening by week. And ironically, here in Arundel, uh, and these are speed crashes. Um, Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Fridays uh, were the time periods where um, we found uh, here in Arundel to be uh, a time period that we were going to focus on for traffic enforcement for speed. So when I planned the traffic details, I planned it accordingly according to the, what the statistics showed us. And obviously Fridays are, you know, Friday nights are a busy time period and so forth. So that's your other sheet that you have in front of you. For a replacement vehicle, as, as you think about what you're going to do for, you know, a, another contract deputy, um, we are going and have in our fleet now the, uh, the Ford SUV, uh, SUV police interceptor. Um, and for 2017, with it fully uh, equipped, just like this right here, we're looking at a, a price tag of 33752 is what another vehicle for 2017 would, would likely cost. And then the sheriff already hit on this, but I just I wanted to just bring it up again that the contract deputy is a very valuable program because it's collaborative problem solving with the community members. And the deputy comes in on a regular basis and touches base with, with the town manager, you know, and they have good, good communication back and forth. And likewise, kind of the town manager has picked up the phone many times and talked to me. Uh, or sent me an email. So we have a good working relationship, but the contract deputy can see the problems, identify it, work for solutions to solve it, and this is the best that, you know, that the community in the interaction have with law enforcement in being able to solve problems together. We have a number of towns that don't have contract deputies. We don't assign a deputy there. If there's a call that comes into that town, we send a deputy, but we can't guarantee you know how fast where they are because we have a big area to cover. So those towns don't they get a different deputy all the time sometimes. They don't get the same deputy. So it changes. When you have somebody that is has the value and has taken on a community because you know uh, Greg Seventy uh, he values his work here. He feels part of this community. And any time there's a major call, kind of takes it personal that, hey, you know, I want, it, I want this solved. I want to try to find out, um, you know, what, uh, what we can do or who did it and that type of thing. So that's a snapshot about where the town of Arundel is uh, over the last five years and gives you some things to think about. And uh, I hope this was, uh, you know, a meaningful, meaningful discussion 
and we would be happy to uh, answer any questions. I have a question. In 2015, you said motor vehicle stops of 902. Was that just the sheriff's department, not the state police? Right. Just These the are just our just statistics. The sheriff's department. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, so if the state police stops somebody on 111 or, or Route 1, that doesn't show. It here. doesn't show here. From a cost perspective, um, am I correct? And I'm, I'm just going to assume ninety thousand because that's kind of what we used in the past. I know it came in a little bit less uh, this year, um, but if we were to hire an additional deputy, we're talking somewhere around one hundred twenty-three, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. That is that a right number? Includes the deputy, includes the vehicle. Yes. Yes. I mean, the, the vehicle is a one-time cost. I mean, of course, you know, they may usually last for four or five years. Yes. Um, but, but yes, that's a, um, and it depends on the county, again, the, the contract is between the, the um, county commissioners and the town. And they want to recoup the full cost of the deputy. So if you get somebody that's um, 15 years on, you're going to be paying a higher wage mm -hmm. than if you get somebody new. Um, and uh, we've had some philosophical discussions and some philosophical differences the way the contract deputy program is administered, but that's the way it's administered right now. So our suggestion would be that, that we work with, with the manager and, and we get a, a lower cost deputy and you know even a newer deputy because what we want here is we want somebody that's new, that's traffic oriented, that's going to go out there and really stop a lot of vehicles. That's what I think. That's really a, a big need here in Arundel, you know, with Route One and um, uh, and Route One Eleven. I think that's a that's a uh, uh, that would be a good developing I think, uh, program. So but again, one hundred and twenty. I just I just added the thirty three, the one time cost for the car, and <coughs> I, I think ninety thousand for it. Now, why wouldn't we do like a three year lease on the cruiser to keep the cost down? You could. Yeah. Yeah. You could. And at what point? I guess rolling into that. At what point? Is it automatically one for one, like the bringing on another deputy automatically gets another cruiser? Like we're buying a brand new cruiser this year. There's no way they could share a cruiser. We, we typically don't. Yeah. Um, we, we, we typically don't. Okay. Um, but when, when it comes to the purchase of the cruisers, we can be very creative. I, you know, uh, the, the county manager has been very creative with several other towns, you know, putting off the cost, you know, having a, a, a loan type program on, you know, in amortizing it over a couple of years. So that could be something that we could do. This grant that you that you wrote, when did that end? September. So we, at this point, we, I wonder if we could use that to offset, but at this point, we can think, ain't yeah. much to offset. Is, yeah. yeah, the good thing, you know, when you're thinking about another deputy that there's a lot of things that we can, you know, as we talk about, you're willing to listen to you, but obviously, currently right now, you get a deputy for 40 hours. Um, that would increase another 80 hours, and that would also look at probably putting this person out at nighttime as well, in the evening times. As you know, Route 1 out there on a Friday and Saturday night is a busy time. Um, and that would also be a good usage of the, the contract deputy, is looking at a schedule that fits the community, and that's workable uh, between you, know, you and us uh, to try to find out, uh, again, when we look at calls for service, when are they coming in at night, and what's the best uses of this person, but I think it gives us a lot more uh, usage of them. And in the response time is the other thing that I think, you know, I think we, Another deputy here, the response time on calls is going to decrease. Do you have? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. This, but because of the grant right now, we do have 80 hours of deputy. No. No. So the grant that I that I wrote and got from the Bureau of Highway Safety is for twenty thousand dollars, but it's also for all the other nine towns oh, that okay. we. All right. But yeah. what I looked oh, at, sister. what I looked at is who needs it most. So Rundo has, has been getting. A lot of uh, a lot of you know patrol, extra patrol beyond your contract deputy. You're getting a detail officer for speed enforcement only um, for you know at least on a 
once a week basis, if not more. Do you have a, a community that may be on the cusp of wanting to do a contract deputy, but is only thinking half to, half the time? Do you have anybody like that at this point? Not that it, not the board hasn't even discussed it, but I'm not sure if you if we could hire one and have it shared between two other communities. Um, if you have one that's close to being. Well, we could, you know, th th that's an interesting concept, and we could certainly, you know, um, we could certainly float that. We we plan to have conversations with Langham and uh, and Hollis is is uh, contemplating a, a contract deputy. Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend it for Hollis, but um, yeah, I mean, we we could certainly enterprise that. Um, but I, I really gotta gotta tell you, I, I we don't. One of my philosophies, I never want to sell fear. I never want to sell that. But I do think, though, that that Arundel is on that cusp right now of really needing that. I mean, it, when we look at uh, uh, the, the activities at, at Bentley's, I mean, that takes a lot of police presence. I mean, when Bentley's has a mass gathering, where typically we, we generate our people down and we're, we're putting our folks down, and we'd like to have, obviously, a, a contract deputy that would be there to kind of organize it and enterprise it. I think with Kate's Green Rebutter, I don't think we've seen the impact from that yet when trucks start coming in and out. I think we're going to need a deputy down there for, for traffic control almost when, the, when those trucks really, when that thing gets up and running uh, full capacity. Um, so I, I, I just think that the proactiveness of, of looking at this now, I think is really, really smart. And, and um, we, 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 we could do half, but from our experience in Acton Shapley, you know, Acton saying, well, gee, we, we need them over here. And Acton Shapley, they, they, they shared a deputy for several years, and both of them are now saying, we want our own guy. And they both want the same contract <laughs> deputy. But, but they, you know, so it, it um, um, you know, we, 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 I appreciate it. Thanks. I, I guess from, from my perspective, um, certainly appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> Uh, but give us numbers. I mean, put put together some, you know, different scenarios, and you know, because we got to take this to the voters, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'd, I'd like to know how much it's going to cost us, whether we do, a, you know, buy the car fully, or you know, to Jason's point, do a three-year, three-year lease. Um, you know, a contractor for, I mean, a deputy for 20 hours, a deputy for an additional, you know, for 40 hours. I mean. Give us, give us some options, put together some price okay. tag on some yeah. options, and then we as a board can deliberate and figure out which route we want to go or which route we want to take to the voters. Yeah, I, I would ask that you authorize the, the manager to speak with uh, County Manager Greg Sensor when it comes to the numbers, because yeah, you know, they're the ones that are actually going to do the, the contract. Okay. If, it, if it turns out from your statistics, that the second deputy would be used primarily in the evening, and the deputy we've got now stays on days. Would that tend to argue for one vehicle for two guys, or is that something that just isn't done? Well, it's. I, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. We, we we have found that these vehicles last much longer when they're assigned to one person. They stay cleaner. They get service and. They're fully equipped. When a deputy rolls up on the scene, it's not like a municipal police officer like Bitterford. When, when these guys line up, they, you know, they've got all their equipment that they want. We have an evidence technician. We have a guy that that's all he does is evidence. But each one of these deputies is trained to, to, to do fingerprint analysis. To have, they have, it's a fully operational unit once they arrive uh, to, a, to a scene. So we kind of... Uh, have them set up their cruises and, and, and to take care of it. So we kind of like each deputy that to, to have their own uh, unit. Because I could see the, the overlap would happen, you know, depending upon what's happening, and then we would be without a car. So I think there would be some overlap, and uh, you know, it, would might, it would be difficult. Isn't the contract deputy on call 24-7? Yes, he is. He, he has to take his vehicle yeah, home. He, he is. He is on call 24-7. We call him at 2 a.m., and he has no vehicle. Have fun, guys. Right. <laughs> You're right. The other thing is, is that <clears throat> the contract deputy, like Greg Seventy, I mean, he's your contract deputy. 
his authority, he wears the badge of the York County Sheriff's Office, his liability, his training, you know, we document everything that he needs to be a deputy. So we take on all of that. So a lot of it goes hand in hand on what we need for equipment and what we would issue a deputy as well. Because he's part of our team as well. Would it happen very often if we had two contract deputies that they'd both be on duty at the same time of day, except no. for extreme circumstance? Well, I'll tell you, I've got, I'm blessed with a person that has 36 years of municipal street experience. I mean, before the chief came to work for the sheriff's office, he works, was working a night shift down in York. So he knows patrol inside and out. The patrol commander also has uh, 20 to 30 years experience at Fairfax County Police Department. So these guys really have done a very, very good job of deploying the personnel when they're needed. So I'm not going to, I wouldn't answer that, but I would defer to the chief. I think that if he did have a situation where, say, you had a, a mass gathering at, at at Bentley's and he had something else going on that he may deploy his people the two contracts at the same time. But I would... Uh, think yeah. that I think, you know, there was... Bentley's notified us this last weekend. They had a major event. Major event. And uh, so is that a time period to make sure we have extra people on? Because also during this weekend we had old Waterboro days where we had nine deputies working. We had everybody deploy basically from the sheriff's side there which left you know we're just not we don't have enough of us basically so I would tend to believe yes there would be sometimes when we look at them and there are major events and or activities going on that you might have both working but the, the good thing would be is to spread them out so they're, they're here almost seven days a week or, or seven days a week Any questions from the audience? Anyone? No, we're available to come down any time, and we really appreciate the time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, Jack? Well, just a really a peripheral question regarding radar signs. Are they, does the town rent those, or does the sheriff department own any of those? And are they of any value? Slowing people down. Well, like, yeah, they, they are, and we don't own one. They're they're about a fifteen thousand um, dollar piece of equipment. We do have access to a regional one. Uh, Wells Police Department is the host of it, but the state gave it to them to kind of get it out to different people. So we clearly can bring it up here and and put it up. Um, some people like to see, uh, and and they do have. You can get the data from them. There's there's computerized. So it's a great thing, so you can see. But some people like to speed just to see how they can get the numbers to go up. What they have also out there, which we would love to buy, it's a little pricey, is a box that goes on. It's just a black box, and it attached to a phone pole. And it does the same thing, but the public doesn't know what it is. And it gives you the true reading. And, that's, and, and we actually can download it. There's an app that you could. Um, you could download it by standing close to it and getting all the data. So we are researching some of those things. Um, obviously, a lot of those are a little pricey, but clearly the trailer, the speed trailer, is something that we can bring down occasionally because it's shared throughout York County. Um, I actually, I have a second question, too. And, and uh, I could only remember what it was. <laughs> I know you had a second question. <laughs> uh, no, it has to do with uh, the stop sign that was put in on 111 at Hill Road. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. What, if any, effect it has had, good, bad, or different in the, since it's been installed? I, I travel it every day. I think, I think that it, it, it has, a, has had a great effect. I think just with that, having that turn lane, I think that it, uh, it's a much better intersection now. And I only say that from personal experience because I travel it every day. Uh, do we have any numbers yet? 
I don't. I didn't. Didn't no, I know you. Didn't research that. I do know when it was new in operation, we had a little yes. fender benders because people right. didn't realize we all are creatures of habit, and people weren't paying attention. Um, so when it newly was installed, we did have yeah. a few. I'm really not aware of anything as of recent, but you know I can definitely research that. Is it easy to get out of your mother's driveway? I was just thinking the same thing. Still, they still have a hard time no. getting out of the driveway. Limerick Road, Limerick Road intersections. Is oh. Yes, that's another one. Uh, that's, yep. Yeah, I think it's... You know, I don't think that helped them any. Yeah. And New Road. Oh, and New, New Road's road, yeah. awful. Well, I, every, every quarter we have a recognition ceremony and a week from Friday at 3 o'clock we're having our annual annual our quarterly recognition ceremony and we're graduating uh, five corrections officers. So you're all welcome to come up and just chit chat and uh, and see the operation that will be this Friday at, I'm sorry, a week from this Friday at 3 o'clock at the Sheriff's Office if you're interested. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Is that County Mutual Aid Agreement. Yes, um, the Sunmain Planning and Development Corporation has been working with a um, variety of municipal officials throughout York County to, uh, in the attempts to put together a public works mutual aid agreement. Um, I've provided in your packet a, um, a, an agreement they, that they're looking to try to get signed. Um, I think the, what the agreement does is, is try to provide an option for a municipality who uh, may have a singular emergency event and uh, it wouldn't be like a natural disaster, a snowstorm and things like that, but a singular emergency event that they need some additional uh, manpower, maybe equipment and resources. And this agreement would provide um, uh, these municipalities options as to what equipment may be available in different municipalities, what manpa manpower may be uh, available as well uh, to help them in the event that uh, uh, help is needed. Um, it's it's not, a, a, not a freebie. The mutual aid agreement provides uh, uh, cost estimates and um, uh, reimbursements to the municipalities. And I, I think it would be a, a, a nice step forward for um, for all these uh, municipalities to get involved in this in the event that it's ever needed. Um, and I would, at this particular point, um, recommend uh, uh, approval to sign it on behalf of Arundel uh, so we could be maybe the first ones that are signing it. I'm not quite sure what it is <coughs> in terms of others, but you know, can you answer my question? Yeah. Else? No. They're, I think they're seeking other municipalities. Roger has a little more expertise in this. Uh, this has been around for a while, and Louis Kelly's been trying to work to put this together. Originally, uh, SOCO started this basically just trying to get an inventory of men and equipment so that if there was an emergency in some, some town, some, sometimes when these rain events went through, one time in October of 96, there was like 13 inches of rain here. But other places in the county, like uh, Camp Ellis, had like 19 inches. So it, they had more damage. This happens, if it's a snowstorm, I think we're all going to be in the same boat. I mean, maybe somebody has a truck go down between County Bump and County Port right now. We're doing a lot of this jolt stuff anyway. But so how would this work, Roger, if you know, we had a Camp Ellis at eight? I mean, what would they do? They would go out to where it was signed out on, signed on? Yeah, to check with whoever. <coughs> Is signed on, knowing at this point that Old Arundel has this particular piece of equipment that they may need, and it would go with an operator, so we wouldn't have somebody, you know, it wouldn't be a rental type of deal. Yeah. And as Keith said, there would be reimbursements for time and and such. So the reimbursement in theory, would come this from is mutual aid, like the fire department has. The reimbursement would come from the town that we're sending it to. Right. Correct. To the host town. Fire departments have had. This is in place yeah. for years. I'm trying to think, reimbursement for us has always come on like natural disasters in the state. You have to consider yeah. yeah. 
I'm sure there'll be some kinks in it at some point, but in theory, it's, it's a good idea. And Larry Meadow started this 20 years ago. And trying to get everybody to kid only takes 20 years to get something done. <laughs> <laughs> years ago, we went down in one of the blizzards and helped the city benefit with three or four loaders and a bunch of trucks in the blizzard. And we got paid FEMA rates, which they were pretty comparable to our regular rates. Yeah, I'm certainly in favor of it. Okay, you want a motion on that? So, Roger, does this really just deal with reimbursement? I mean, I mean, if some community's in trouble, are we going to go? And they call us, are we going to go? I would expect that we'll no, go. We'll we cut to details later. Yeah. So this is just setting up some of the methodology to get right, payment to get it back. But this is what Southern Maine's been working on mostly yeah. is how do you go about recouping time and, yeah. and such. I'd make a motion that we sign a mutual aid agreement. That's for Keith's side, right? Um, any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? Great. Thank you. And how about surplus equipment? I would defer to Mr. Chansky here if he's on limited time frame. So oh. Appreciate that. Back this. <laughs> It's up to the board. Yeah, it's up to the board. But I won't do that. Yeah. All right. Let's go to appointment confirmation for the zoning board of appeals. Yes, I uh, Paul had come into my office uh, probably over a month or so ago. New to the community, uh, wanted to get involved. Um, I told him that we were desperately looking for somebody <laughs> on the zoning board of appeals, and he graciously said that he would. Uh, he would uh, take an appointment if, if so appointed. So I, I uh, put forth uh, his information for you to look at, uh, and at this point I would recommend that we uh, that you confirm an appointment of Paul Chansky to the Zoning Board of Appeals. We'll approve the appointment before he gets out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions? All in favor? Thank you. You got it. I appreciate it. Let me off easy. Yeah. 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 If you could stop by, yeah. you could stop by the office you know, next week or something and just sign your sign papers. Your paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. paper yeah. afterwards and I'll swear you in when you stop by. Okay. We'll Thank you. That. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Good to see you. Alrighty. Now let's go to. I just wanted to update yeah. you about current road projects. Uh, the Downing Road, I borrowed a sign from Kennebunk Port today and put it up on the Downing Road for some advance notice. The closure it looks like it's actually going to take place the 1st of August through the 25th. That could depend a little bit and vary on where the box pipe is coming from, box culvert. They're still looking on or about the 2nd or 3rd to have that thing ready to set. So again, once that's in, they still got to bring everything back up to grade, get guardrails in before it can open to traffic. It may be open to emergency traffic prior to that, but once the guardrails are up, then we could open it whether it's paved or not. But they're still on schedule, everything looks good so far, so they're ready to go. So when does the school start? August 29th, 20th, early. We should be fine. So when when's that going to be shut down? Uh, the the first through the through the twenty fifth is the actual closure. So you have to change the alternative way to travel. Yeah, yeah. The, the work. These guys that are going to the parking ride and getting up and stuff, it's going to affect them. I know yeah. somebody's already complaining about it. <laughs> uh, some other projects reclaiming has has been done on Liberty Acres today. It'll be paved Wednesday or Thursday this week, so that's one of the developments we planned on. It's already smoother. 
Yeah. I'm sure it is. They have a little trouble chasing driveways, and as every time you reclaim something, by the time it gets reclaimed and then paved, your grade comes up. So, tying in driveways, we'll be there the day after the base is on it to put some additional gravel in any of the driveways, the dirt driveways. The paved driveways, they usually blend in, but they've got to chase grades in these developments to get them to match. Riverwind is also on the docker. That was moved up from next year because of our contract price on the dining room. So we're able to bring another project forward this year to get it done. So that's looking good. This sign trailer that I borrowed today from Kenny Bump Port is the same one, identical to what we, we get from uh, Kenny Bump for a Senate Road closure last month. These things average five to six grand. I would think it would be a wise investment maybe for us in the future and maybe even get a safety grant from Maine Municipal. We've got several from them to put something like this in. That will also cover the speed. It'll do right up. doesn't probably give you the printout that they're looking for, but it would be a speed trailer as well as any other info for advanced warnings or probably being suffers. Who knows? But, those things are out there, and, and the current pricing is five to six thousand bucks. So, might be something to consider in the future. Can we sneak something like that through the tip? Slide through the fire department? Well, I'd have to look at that. Yeah. We may be stretching it a little bit yeah. here, but <coughs> safety grants from Maine Municipal. Usually, they've been pretty good to us, and there's two different opportunities each year. April 30th and September 30th, you have to have them in for. They look at it, review it, they're the ones that carry out the workman's call. And I've got probably five or six grants from them so far. Traffic cone signs, all that stuff. As long as you can bring it in under the safety issue as far as advanced warning and stuff. They've been pretty good. Can, you, the job. The for yeah. can you two work together yeah. and get you something? What did you do on Senate Road? I've been down there. So. Just past Goff Brook, where the major culvert is, Fogel put in 20 years ago, there was an additional pipe there. There was actually two there. There's a little creek. There's no way to divert it back into the main part of Goff Brook. There was two of them there. The inlets were 20 feet apart. The outlets were touching. And I had no idea why they would have done that <laughs> until we got there and started to do it. And there was a two-foot pine stump there, right directly over the <laughs> <of> the <park. laughs> The stump filled the back of a dump truck. There's no new pipe in there, but it was 10 feet deep, so we had to close the road. We did it for two days. They uh, came in and paved it for us the following day, so it was Tuesday, Wednesday, back in June. I tied in with the campground to make sure he didn't have any events or anything going down. Road closures, we don't even try when school's going because it's just a disaster, but with a close business like that, usually we try to work it out. So Dave Berg was good to work with him. Get it done. Okay. The only comment, the question I have, and I, we talked about this during budget season. Um, you know, I'd like, you know, give us some thought, Rod, between now and when we start looking at the budget again. It's, you know, we, I, from a board perspective, I think it'd be nice to know, looking ahead, what we've got planned for the next three, four, or five years, you know, so that we can make sure that we put the right amount of money. We got it. Perfect timing. That's not your coffee. <coughs> well, I mean, what I would say is, if you, you know, probably share this with. That's the, five years. Now. With the rest of us, and we can, especially during budget season, so that we can. Make sure that we give you the right money that's needed and we can... They did that in March and it's already off because we weren't able to yeah. do some extra work. So. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And hopefully, you know, I mean, something like what happened this year is really good. You know, if you're able to yeah. get ahead on some of these. But. Yeah. We are in need of another plow truck. I had a military surplus truck. We need to go here so I don't. I've had one that's out of service. The sticker runs out in August and it is done for. Oops, sorry. I have looked at one of these that Acton got. They're using it as a brush truck. But I think these things are making excellent plow trucks. But anyway, he 
these things average five to ten thousand miles. They're sitting on a base someplace. This particular one is sitting in oh Fayetteville, Fort Bragg. That doesn't mean we're going to get this one. But this type of truck is cropped up because the military is updating this type of two and a half ton truck to armored cabs. So these have become obsolete for them. Again, they're averaging five to ten thousand miles. Original acquisition cost is $104,626. We can buy this truck for 2% of that, which is $2,092.52. The problem is transportation. Average transport costs, according to Karen Holbrook, who owns a truck brokerage firm in town, she's telling me in the I-95 Florida, it's averaging about $250 a mile. We can load it on a truck deck truck and transport it to us. If you find something out of the I-95 car, it can go up to three bucks a mile. Now Fort Bragg is about 1,200 miles away, so that's $3,600 in transportation alone. Unless somebody wants to go down to the back. That'd be 80 second airboard drop it off. Yeah. Well, some of these actually have capability to be airlifted, but I don't think they do that for us. <laughs> this particular type does. What type of work rod would you need to do to make this a plow truck? Actually, we went up and took a lot of pictures of the one that Acton has. Conventional, it's got a conventional frame, it's a cab over. The wheelbase is short enough so the turning radius would be pretty good. The military, I think, underrates them, but this is under CDLs, like 20,000, 22,000 GBWs. It is an all-wheel drive truck. Turning radius, again, is, is fairly well on it. Uh, standard frame width, 34 inches, just like everything else in production that, for that size truck. We put a hitch on it that was drop type hitch, put a 10 foot model on it, gear it up with a sander, and we'd have a truck that will do intersections developments. And what I would ask for is that we take some money out of capital reserve, which the last I knew. Yeah, capital equipment in first of June before the additional this year's appropriation goes in it was fifty eight thousand dollars. What I'd like to do is get enough money to get one of these, get it here, and equip it, and I believe we could do that for about fifteen thousand dollars. Again, the one that they have up in Acton, they got from the Forest Service. They got it from Acton. It has about 5,000 miles on it. I looked at the truck, took a tape measure on cameras, and took a lot of pictures of these things. Spec-wise, I don't know how you could spec a better plow truck. So the government bought a truck for $102,000. 104, 626. Uh, really? And they're selling it for 2% of that? They will sell anything over $100,000 is 2%. If it's less than $100,000, they'll charge you 4% of the original acquisition cost. That's just to municipalities though, right? Not to you have to be private. Yeah. Listen, yeah. Right. Private is not going to go right. by it. Just do the same. Once, if you look on the top of that, it tells you a screening date. Any municipality that wants to get involved in this puts in for it prior to that screening date. After that, if nobody takes that truck, one of the uh, big brokerage outfits Iron Planets one will suck these things up and they'll auction them off to the private sector. A lot of times they're right where they're sitting right now. But they won't go for 2% of the cost. They're averaging. What is it? What is the make? The actual make has been taken over by Oshkosh. That is right now a specialized truck made out of a company in Texas. Stuart Stevenson makes that cat. All the running gear, it's got a Caterpillar motor and house and transmission. It's all conventional, other than the fact that Stuart and Stevenson is the manufacturer out of Texas. So you can get parts for it, huh? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's what else. We have a five ton that we got from surplus, geared that up. That one has a Cummins motor and analysis and transmission. All the parts are viable down there. Really yeah. Cap, Allison, Hendrickson. All right here in Portland, you can get it, get it off. Yeah, that was our original worry. And I stayed away from these for the longest time because 
They used to charge 4% straight across the board. And I found out. How many miles are on it? And now what year? Ah, these are averaging 2004 vintage, some of 2003s. Oh. I've found them all over the country. Here's one that's just a little further away. It's in North Dakota. <laughs> yes. I was just going to say, no one has somebody, know somebody yeah. coming over before Brad wants a free ride. <laughs> 9,800 miles on that one. Roger, the state screening didn't have any of those? The state, never... I have to deal with a guy that works for the state surplus, but the state doesn't go out and screen this stuff anymore. You can go on this website and look yourself. They just don't do it. They used to. Yeah. The town's fortunate to have Roger doing this. I'm pretty familiar with the screening process because they used to do it for the airport in Biddeford. And there was a lot of good equipment out there. Yeah, you guys got it for passed. nothing because yeah, it was an airport. But the city Zero. of Biddeford passed on it. They've always just jumped. You know, they didn't want to work on it. But you know, like I say, the town's fortunate to Roger, for Roger to go out and look for this stuff because there is some really good equipment. There. Well, you still look at it only $5,000 by the time, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's still cheap money. Air airports get it for nothing. Yeah, but I'm saying to even um, to even buy it and get for, it shipped here. Right. I mean, if you can, even if you have to scrap it because the engine's no good. Oh no! It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep want to replace things. the engine. That's what you want. You have to keep no. them in service for 18 months. After 18 months, you can do what you like. If it doesn't work out, you can sell it after a, at time frame. But you have to have it for 18 months, and you have to put it into service some kind. So what do you have to do, bid on this? I mean, do you have to... I actually have to put in a request through the guy in Augusta. I have up till the 23rd to withdraw or, or whatever. So far, no one had put in for that truck, this particular one. But every once in a while, the good old boy system kicks in, and somebody in North Carolina might end up with this truck. Yeah. And you can't fight that. Or the, or the 1,200 miles away. Yeah, I mean, somebody else could come in and ask for this. An airport. Yeah. They make a plow truck out of it. They get first crap, and it's feds. They get it for nothing. Yeah. So why would why would you have it shipped up if it doesn't require a CDL? Is it it's roadworthy and everything's all yeah, set? Whether it you have a certain amount of time to get these off the base. Right, but couldn't so somebody just fly down and drive back? Transport a plate. I mean, you could. It could be. That's what I said. Unless somebody wants to draw it down and get it. Yeah. What do you mm -hmm. offer? You're comfortable <laughs> buying this side unseen. Expecting I wasn't, but I have seen several of them, and in this may not have it. I mean, come, July twenty third might come. Somebody else could end up with this, and you just keep looking through. And the trick is to find something in that I ninety five corridor, which is either there, or a lot of it comes into New Jersey for dicks. But these things are moving right now because they're being replaced by out cab trucks. That's the only reason they get rid of them. That other beast that we got, that's a five ton military truck. And it's an all wheel drive, six wheel all wheel drive. That truck's got 5,300 miles on it. When we're hauling salts in, the mechanic was driving it and it will walk away and leave the other truck behind. Just loaded, taken off. So I used to think these things were, you had to put a stick up next to them to see if they were moving. That's not the case. These things go pretty good. They're not turned by cruises, but they go pretty good. This one, do you need authorization to? Yeah, I believe that we need authorization. I, I think he's looking up to 15000 from the Cap Reserve Fund. That we buy the truck, to get it here. In the event, we need to, to spend that amount uh, to get it in service. So. Did you authorize Roger to uh, look into getting this truck? He's got one that's not going to take a stick up. Winter's yeah. coming. <coughs> yeah, and hopefully we find something that's. I mean, it may, it may not happen. It may not happen right off. You never know. Going through the site. Is this a full road truck? Or are you using it for, like, we you use your time to ask now? This yeah. is basically the. Yeah. No, I. I I was just curious what he's going to use it for. It's, it's too big to do, do your intersection. It's board. actually not. Okay. We put it on the wing on it. It's got a sander. And 
It could be in it. Because it's a cab open, the visibility is good. Should be fine. You made that motion up to the fifteen thousand. Yes, I'll second. Okay. Motion and a second. Any more discussion? Yeah, I just. I, the only the only thing that I would ask Roger if there's any way possible to get a little bit more close-up pictures, or you know, the interior, or yeah, you know, what you can't see here is if you look underneath the picture of the actual truck. You have close-ups of the rest of it. Sometimes they're blurry, like this one. If you look at that right-hand picture, it's actually the serial yeah. numbers and stuff on it, and the camera's a little blurry. You can blow this up when you've got it online, Yeah. and it gives you all the information. A lot of times they take an actual picture of the allometer and the, the speedometer as well. This one didn't. Oh, wow, this one looks like a crew cab. Is it? Nope. Mm -hmm. Nope. And worst, worst case scenario, Dan, if you can buy this thing for two to four thousand, get it back here, and before you put the other ten thousand into getting it roadworthy, I mean, you know, you're only on the hook for two to four thousand. You get it back here, and it turns out the engine is ready to die, or the tranny's getting ready to drop out. You cut your losses at four thousand. I'm not worried about the engine. I mean, I think the you know. Being it's a Caterpillar a, six yeah, owner. I'm not worried about Diesel, the, engine, the, the I'm transmission. Is. I'm worried that you know the, the seats of you know the, the mice and what have you and the whole shebang and you get outside and is all going. No problem. You know. Totally I know where you can get it. Has anything stuff around? Where can get to, to buy a truck outright in this size with the capabilities this, this has, geared up, usually you're looking at whatever the price of the cabin chassis is and double it to equip it. Right now, I would be willing to guess that this truck would be in $125,000 to $140,000 range equipped if you went out and bought one that would do everything this way. Um, I've never seen condition before as repairable. I'm just saying, like when you're looking at online auction Some stuff, of it it's will like tell you that it's, you know, for parts only or something like right, that. Right, but still repairable. Yeah. I mean, what's something's got to be repaired? Yeah, something's. Because it's usually rough. You get scared of the rough ones, but repairable. Yeah. Well, might be some worse of them than rough. are rough, and they tell you on it, you know, for parts only or does not run or whatever. That's not the case on this particular one. But again, you may find one close to home. We may not. So you're going to keep looking. Once you know you've got some funds, you're just going to keep looking and yeah. see if you can. You have to look for it, put in for it, and if you're not on the top of the list, or again, some guy like Jim that works for the yeah. feds with the FAA, again, yeah. if you've got a D7 dozer and a, an Oshkosh all-wheel drive truck that they absorbed into their fleet after the airport was done with it, they, they got it for nothing. You only have to keep it a year. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to go get this truck and, and lend it to us? We need to build an airport. No, just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Any more discussion on that? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Thank you, folks. Right. The city of Biffin laughed at me when I brought the D7 and the Oshkosh. I showed Phil a picture of one of these earlier. It's a D7 high track dozer. The original price they put on there, I'm sure, is a misprint, and they forgot the one. But even at 120,000, that dozer could be bought for what do they have? 2,900 bucks. 246388. 246388. It's got 400 some odd hours on it. I'll take three of them. <laughs> I was going to say, can we get this deal for anybody? <laughs> the time to run them for 18 months. <laughs> After that, I told Pete before we could use this as a fundraiser. <laughs> I think that would be something like that. What does that machine wear? Holy smokes. That machine, high track, that's got to be worth sixty to 80000 anywhere today. At that vintage. Yeah. Really fine. The only minute it's Cherry Point. 
Yeah. Yeah. The Marine Air Station in North Carolina. That one. These things are all over the country, and it depends on the basis. I mean, I've seen some of those trucks. But there was one in North Dakota that less than 2,000 miles off. That's a long ride. Do they still do screening at that project? No. Uh, Alright, the problem with the state not doing the screening is you've got people coming in and going into the Navy Yard from out of state and stuff all the time, yeah. right under our noses. That, that continued because it was Maybe a little bit of laziness from the state years ago. Good. Okay. The intake on the other fender, and they were slow and okay. yeah. the other yeah. they do 45 miles off. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask Sheriff King one question. It doesn't have a lot to do with what we have for tonight. But uh, Cake's mother can lab the excavating have passed the town a couple of times to get the speed limit reduced in that general area for all the truck traffic, yeah. having a really hard time with it. Yeah. And the town didn't get very good response from the state. They were denied the request to reduce the speed limit. Would the Sheriff's Department have a little bit more leverage well, in that area than the town well, I mean, with the state? Yeah, the, the chief talks to the highway department all the time. And, uh... Well, the Department of Transportation. So they look at a lot of different things to make there. The engineers take a look at, you know, uh, accidents and all that other material. Um, clearly, we could ask to speak with the regional engineer that does the speed maintenance uh, to ask him what the rationale is to keep it there. And then, obviously, if we have supporting data that shows that there's crashes, they also have it too, um, but that would be the, the indication to also lower the speed. But, yeah. Is there a specific time when the trucks are leaving? <coughs> yeah, early morning and late afternoon, people go by there, it's 50 mile an hour, yeah. and, and you pull out with a truck mm -hmm. loaded, uh, Kate's does it, and we do it. And, and you, they blow the horn and they mm -hmm. tell you you're number one and yeah. they pass you on a solid line yeah. and it gets a little bit hairy sometimes. Well, perhaps this might be something that we need Greg to adjust the schedule and to be down there during those times and get that's valuable information. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was last year uh, there was a truck turning on to Drew's Mill Road, a left-hand turn. Mm -hmm. And a young lady came up Route 111. I don't know why she didn't get hurt, but she didn't. Fortunately, drove right in the back of that truck. No. That probably by the time she hit the truck, she was probably still doing 30. Wow. And and she didn't get hurt. Thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. But but it, it's a little bit hairy with the yeah. truck traffic. And it starts. At, what time does it start usually? Usually. Between six and between six and, and eight in the morning, and four to five thirty in the afternoon, it's mm -hmm. really tough. You know what Kate Butter's schedule is on that truck? They must be throughout the day, right? Uh, I don't know what their schedule is, but they have trucks going out quite regular. Yeah. Imagine that. That's a big issue there with their truck when they're, they're much, you know, a lot longer trucks. Yeah. I think they came 
they came to the town, I think when Todd was here, yeah. asked if uh, the town would request a speed reduction and they were denied. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you got to be asked that question yet. was not. Or not. But I think Todd was asked twice. Even if they just reduced it from New York Road to where the, where the uh, limit road comes out. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to see that, that I'd like to see that limit road intersection at 40 instead of 50. That is a really tough intersection right there. And it's getting worse because people can't get out of New Road, so they're all going Limerick Road, and, and it's not getting any better. That's the way I go now, even if I have to head in the traffic sometimes, it's easy to get out. Yeah, I go the Rick Road and make the right turn, but then I have to sit on the road and make the left turn. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, that's why I don't mind all the leases, because it's the only way you can get out there. Remember who the lead yeah, guy is on the transportation committee? Your yeah. neighbor, Wayne Perry. I know where it is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right in the middle of that stretch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Okay. Yeah, you remember your other question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roger. I think it's up, man. But I have a new one. Oh, uh, 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 Sure, let me just shut this off.